to sell off, uh, you know, it's 300 corporately owned locations. Uh, so the chunk in, in Tampa, Florida area was a, was a big part of that, although they've got a lot more to go. Uh, you know, also this morning, Phil uh, got word that Ajo Del Hayes has completed its acquisition of its New York based e-commerce rival Fresh Direct. And so they are going to be operating Fresh Direct as another one of its uh, five local USA brands. It's interesting, uh, the story about Fresh Encounter and Save a Lot. I think that, you know, Mike, Spil uh, Mike Needler uh, Jr. is doing a great job, as, as his dad did, uh, with Fresh Encounter. I was, I was surprised to hear this. Um, on one hand, because of, of the format change, but I wasn't surprised. And, and I do think that uh, Mike is, is one of those retailers that we should be watching in the future. He's gonna, I think, make uh, a lot of bold moves. Um, the, the prediction that I have for 2021 is the supermarket industry, all the, all the hot stories are gonna happen right here in Southern California. Um, and, and I'll tell you why. What's happened over the past couple days has been phenomenal. So earlier this morning, um, it was announced that Albertsons is going to stop using, as of February 21st, in Southern California, its own unionized delivery trucks and drivers. And needless to say, there's going to be some uh, spill off there. Um, some people are going to get laid off. They'll find some people other jobs. Uh, but also what I find interesting, when um, Albertsons filed their IPO, they were very adamant about uh, their relationship with Instacart. Uh, since that point in time, we've seen Albertsons push to have more and more people using click and collect. And uh, what we're also seeing is DoorDash getting heavily involved with Albertsons. Um, and again, it all stems from Proposition 22 um, that was passed here in California that doesn't make gig workers um, applicable for benefits and healthcare and all those other things. And they cost more. When, you, when you've got that. So clearly this is an interesting move that we should be watching on Albertsons. Um, also, um, we have a bad news story um, about COVID-19. Uh, there have been more than 137 LA area supermarkets in November and December where they've had incidents of COVID-19 and uh, 854 supermarket workers in LA County alone have tested positive in the last two months. Um, also, the, the story that I am the most upset about, and you know, you, we, we've been talking for close to a year now about the importance of you know, wearing masks and why that's important. Well, Sunday, uh, two days ago, there have been uh, anti-mask vendettas um, in Ralph's supermarket and the Westfield Century City Mall where um, one shopper rejected an offer of a mask. He said, I don't need that. I don't wear masks uh, when the store offered him one. Um, another man said he tested negative, which is why he isn't wearing a mask. And he called another customer at Ralph's a mask Nazi, and then an unmasked woman tried to ram her shopping cart into a masked man, claiming that he hit her, and later she was seen kicking him in the checkout line. Her comment is, come on, patriots, show them what's up, she could be heard saying on the video. What is going on here? Well, you know, Phil we're now seeing customers attacking other customers that are wearing masks? It's ridiculous, Phil, and and all that, all, all those stories are up on your Twitter. I'm sure you can find them. Just look for, you know, search for Ralph's idiots, you know, masks, and I'm sure <laughs> you'll find it right away. You know, the other thing that I I, I read this morning was that uh, the governor here in New York said that that the 30 percent of the people who've been offered a vaccine haven't taken it. Um, you know, this country is just is gone off the rails and, and people in the name of liberty are doing uh, absurd things to the rest of the people. And uh, it's, it's ridiculous, Bill. And, and John, on the news, the, oh, sorry. yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I was just gonna say on the news this morning, they, I don't know if you guys saw, you know, they was on NBC and they 
interviewed a guy in the ICU who could barely talk. And he said, I, I thought masks were political. Don't do what I did. You know, I didn't wear a mask, wear a mask. I mean, I don't know how you could think it's political when you're watching the news every day and you see like, you know, how many mobile morgues there are, how many hospital <laughs> beds are filled. Like you, you have doctors and nurses pleading with people to take proper precautions. I don't know how you could think that this is a made up story. I know I it, it's ridiculous. And just one thing, I don't want to leave the vaccine part. Um, and, and then uh, Christine, love to hear what you have to say. Uh, but um, there's a story that I saw over the weekend that the new AstraZeneca uh, vaccine in England has created problems for a certain subset of the population. And as long as we have these stories, I think we're going to have more people not wanting it. So um, a few women have taken the vaccine and they had recently been to a plastic surgeon and had fillers put in. Uh, you can tell I, I don't have any fillers. And after they had the vaccine, the fillers blew up um, mm. in, in their face. So the more of these stories that we're gonna see, whether it's about food allergies, whether it's about fillers and so on, are gonna turn off, John, you know, 30, 40% of the country to not get it. And, and they don't know what the truth really is. I think for, you know, for grocery stores, I think about who else was in, who else was in that Ralph's that day, you know, what other customers are shopping there and observing that altercation and are not going to go back to Ralph's because of that. You know, if you're not, um, if you're not enforcing a mask mandate, gosh, such a tough position that store employees and managers are put in, um, you know, but for customers who, who are cautious and are maybe a little bit nervous going to the store, but are just doing the best they can, or they've got kids in tow with them. What kind of environment are you creating for, you know, for those guests? What kind of damage is going to be done to the business, um, you know, if these kinds of events keep happening? If you don't, if your other customers don't feel like they're going into a safe place or an environment, you know, of trust. Yeah, the supermarket has become a very scary place. Uh, Pat, Jackson, anything you want to add before we move on? Yeah. Well, that was true of restaurants, too, when they were allowing indoor dining, but most states are not allowing it now. So it isn't as much an issue. And when you sit outside, you're supposed to be wearing your mask while you're not eating. But a lot of people think it's much safer to eat outside, and they don't even wear the mask while they're not eating. Jackson. I've spoken with plenty of convenience store operators to say that they have their employees certainly pushing masks, but they don't want them to force it, not because they don't want customers to be wearing masks, but because they're worried about the safety of their employees. And I mean, these, you know, a lot of these folks are paid minimum wage and, and they have to carry this huge burden on their shoulders to, you know, enforce these very important guidelines and it's it's just a tough situation all around for sure for customers and employees alike well i can assure you that the next time i'm in ralph's uh, if this woman comes up to me and causes problems i am not a violent person at all but i will take her shopping cart and i will throw it down on the ground and i will smile through my mask so jen let's talk about trader joe's what's what's their latest move Yes, I'm, you know, the other big story of, of last year and, and this year, and, you know, hopefully a, a story that is inspiring a great deal of change has been, you know, the diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, since, you know, George Floyd was killed in, in late May, um, and then all the, the social unrest that came out of that, and, and, then, and then some positive change. And in and our January, February print cover story is on diversity, equity, and inclusion. I am, I am working on that story now. And as part of that, I was looking at um, Trader Joe's update to what the progress it's made since, since June uh, with regard to diversity and inclusion. And at Trader Joe's, they are focusing in particular on their black crew members. So they've made a number of, of strides since, since early June. Um, they have hired a diversity and inclusion director they have established an annual $500,000 fund to black crew members and their families for uh, education. So for you know, tuition and um, to help pay for, for their education costs. 
And um, they've also, you know, we've talked about this before um, earlier last year, there was an organization that came out the 15% pledge mm -hmm. and they, you know, asked major retailers across the country to ensure that at least 15% of the, sh the products on their, their shelves were from black owned businesses because about 15% of the population in this country is black. And so Trader Joe's, I don't know, you know, they didn't specifically say that they were accepting that challenge, but they did have a goal of, of making sure that 15% of their new products were from black owned businesses. And they, they are, they, they hold an, um, regular tasting panels where they, you know, sort of all the buyers get together and decide, you know, what new products they're bringing in. So they've actually exceeded that goal. And they said since June on average, 25% of the products that they're sampling to see if they want to bring them in are from black owned businesses. And then they named some, they've got a couple of wines and um, some cookies that are from, you know, from black owned businesses that are on shelves now, and they're working to further that goal. And then also, I thought this was interesting. They are looking at the diversity of a neighborhood when they, as a, you know, focusing in on that, when they consider new locations for Trader Joe's. So they gave the example of, of a new store, and I'm not sure the opening date yet of this store, but in Harlem. And it sounds like it's in an interesting building that's going to have the new uh, headquarters of the National Urban League. Uh, it's also going to have New York's first civil rights museum and affordable housing. So it sounds like a mixed use building in which there will be a Trader Joe's in Harlem. Interesting. Uh, what, it, what it brings to mind for me is that this is not a new story. I remember uh, when I was still in New York, so that's uh, years ago, and uh, basically uh, with a major retailer, New York based, um, that, you know, the Rainbow Coalition uh, came along calling, um, and I was in this room with the retailer and Jesse Jackson and his whole group, and they were asking for the same thing. 30 plus years ago, they had, you know, charts, this is before PowerPoint, um, you know, uh, on, on big cardboard, where they showed the amount of black customers that this chain had, the amount of money um, that were in white only banks from this chain, and they suggested this percentage go to the banks, how much advertising was going to black owned media. So this is not you know, a new story. Do you think that finally we're going to achieve something with this? Well, just, you know, I've been interviewing Walmart and, you know, researching Kroger's efforts, Albertsons, obviously Trader Joe's. I really hope so. I'm, I'm hopeful that, that finally we can move the needle on this. I mean, it's certainly, it seems a priority and an area of focus for the major players in the industry. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, there's no question. So Christine, you have a really interesting story I love. So you took Kroger's trends for 2021 and compared them to Whole Foods trends for 2021. And what did you find? Uh, well, Phil, number one, mushrooms are having a moment. It's mushrooms. Yay! Yeah. I love yeah. mushrooms. <laughs> in ahead in 2021 um you know there was some there was some overlap um no surprise whole foods was the one that has boozy kombucha as their trend kroger didn't have that listed as, as mm -hmm. one of their trends. but um overall the interesting overlap is you know number one in wellness which we see every january of course but this idea of superfoods and specifically immunity boosters you know oranges had runaway sales other citrus fruit runaway sales throughout 2020 it's people looking for anything to give them a leg up, anything to support the immune system. Um, but some of the other things that we're looking at as far as like specific foods and ingredients heading into, you know, this new year, um, adaptogens, uh, elements that are um, thought to kind of promote your body's, you know, stress response. Um, so whether we're talking about powders that you can put into a smoothie or elderberry extract, you know, we see elderberry juice, elderberry vitamins, that kind of thing. Um, anything that is going to, again, kind of moderate the stress response because it's still going to be a stressful year, right? We're still, we're still dealing with that. Um, in addition, um, meat sales, you know, were, were really strong throughout 2020. So we're going to continue to see um, easy prepare items, things where you can uh, kind of do gourmet 
making it easy, easy to go gourmet, um, whether that's a, a home charcuterie board or um, other things that let you, you know, sample some new ingredients, maybe some global flavors um, without having to do a really involved 15 ingredient list, spice blends, your curry, you know, your simmer sauces, that kind of thing. Um, those are going to be big. Uh, items with caffeine, go figure, um, another trend, uh, you know, to, to perk us all up as we, as we start this new year. Um, so that was a, uh, that was a really interesting, um, you know, kind of comparison that we, that we saw anything to make you sort of future proof or engage in biohacking is, is the term that they used. So Christine, I want to go back to two points that you made one about immunity. Uh, mm -hmm. so as you pointed out with, uh, citrus, we saw that going up through the roof because of vitamin C, uh, also vitamin D and also to tag on to the mushrooms. So, um, mushrooms are one of the, or is the only, uh, vegetable that naturally contains vitamin D. Mm -hmm. And what's happened is over the past couple of years, um, there's a company here in California, Monterey Mushrooms, mm -hmm. who have been hitting uh, the mushrooms with a UV light, which then brings the mushrooms up to 100% RDA of vitamin D. And leading supermarkets like Hy-Vee have put them on the shelves and so on. And that's another reason for that spike in mushrooms. Um, and it's good news. I mean, the fact that we can elevate people to really think about you know, their immunity, their diets, that's great. And talking about that, uh, Christine, you know, you've gotten some analysis of what different groups are talking about with the US dietary guidelines that were just issued. Sure. That was another thing that happened late last month is um, the USDA and HHS released the 2020 to 2025 uh, new dietary guidelines for Americans. That's something that comes out every five years um, that's you know, required by law. For adults, it's a lot of the same. It's, you know, fresh foods, eat more whole fruits and vegetables, vary your proteins, choose low fat dairy or fortified soy options and limit your added sugars or um, saturated fats. One of the interesting points from the executive summary of that report was that more than half of Americans have at least one chronic disease linked to poor diet, which is kind of astounding when you think of it. So the emphasis um, with this new release, this new addition of the dietary guidelines, make every bite count. Um, they're encouraging people to choose you know, nutrient dense foods. Again, your, your whole fruits and vegetables um, versus more processed foods. A couple of things um, that didn't change, they didn't change the recommended limit on added sugars, and they didn't change the recommended limit on alcohol consumption for, for adult men. Currently that stands at two drinks for men, one drink for women. Um, some groups and the scientific advisory committee that was in charge with providing recommendations for this report had recommended reducing that alcohol consumption to one drink a day for men um, and reducing added sugars to no more than 6% of calories. Consumers are still, you know, looking at added sugars with the uh, trend toward keto diets, which both Whole Foods and Kroger noted in their predictions for 2021. Um, that's something that consumers are going to be on the lookout for anyhow. So, you know, we'll have to see any policy impacts in terms of the school lunch program. Um, but really, it was more of a um, an eyebrow raiser for those who had uh, recommended these changes um, rather than anything that was really headline making. And also, when we look at the whole uh, dietitian and nutrition community, a lot of them are up in arms um, about the two points that you made, as well as not coming out more strongly about limiting the amount of uh, meat, animal proteins right. that, that we consume. So is this story now over? Or is just the beginning where, uh, whether it's retail dietitians or nutritionists or hospital dietitians, you know, are up in arms and are going to be demanding change and not waiting for five years? Sure, it's it's never over, is it, Phil? Yeah, this with the uh, with a new a new incoming administration um, expected later this month. Um, some of these groups are pushing for you know, a renewed look at recommendations. This is, as the USDA and HHS said themselves in the introduction to the report, this is a starting point. This is a first step. It is used to inform policy decisions or even, you know, posters you see at your doctor's office, that kind of thing. But it's not the end all be all. And absolutely, um, you know, especially with 
groups are saying, well, there was a preponderance of evidence. They're going to keep pushing for, you know, further changes and to, and to see things um, evolve over the next five years. Well, we can only hope that some of those changes are made and, and communicated properly to consumers because consumers are more confused than ever before, especially when the dietary guidelines come out. They're not going to read, you know, a document this thick uh, and they're just going to read the headlines um, in the newspaper or on the news and, you know, walk away further confused. So, Jackson, um, yes way. What's going on there? Yeah, so Yesway has been arguably one of the fastest growing chains in the convenience industry in the U.S. for the past couple of years. In the beginning of 2018, they had about 80 stores. In the beginning of 2020, they had more than 400. And they've signaled big time that they're going to continue to grow and continue to renovate uh, during 2021. Uh, they just finished remodeling one of their uh, Allsup stores. Back in 2019, they uh, acquired the Allsup chain down in the Southwest. And if you live in New Mexico, Texas, you're going to see a lot of these Yesway and Allsup stores just transform very quickly uh, as they're uh, raised and rebuilt. And they're even looking at uh, possibly uh, acquiring somewhere around 200 stores this year. Uh, they just added uh, two more industry experts to their executive team. A lot of big moves from Yesway, again, signaling some continued growth from that brand. So what are you looking for when you look at Yesway? Is, is it going to be more mobile ordering? Is it going to be more drive-throughs? If you had a crystal ball that you were looking at just on Yesway, not the whole industry, what do you think is going to happen next? Well, Yesway is a, a really interesting chain. And, and one reason that uh, they acquired Allsup's is that it's so similar to the way they have their stores set up. Yesway is very community oriented. Uh, they, they don't go too terribly high tech. Um, however, they are very smart about the way they roll out their loyalty programs. Uh, when they enter a, a new area, they'll have this big festival where they invite the entire community and they'll talk about their loyalty program and all their offerings. So immediately they have an instant access to the community around them and they're, they're very good at integrating themselves. So I think we're gonna see a lot of that uh, sort of activity from Yesway. And Pat, Looking to your crystal ball, uh, 2021 restaurants, is it going to be better or worse? Well, I hope it's better. It can't get much worse. But as far as some of the trends go, you know, some of them do overlap with supermarket trends. A lot of um, operators are introducing adaptogens and immunity boosting menu items, especially those in the healthier, fast casual segment. So we've seen some of that. Um, as far as alcohol goes, I don't think anyone is going to limit themselves to one drink a day <laughs> because <laughs> as the pandemic has proven, uh, people, alcohol consumption has gone up and restaurants are responding to this by doing many more, you know, uh, cocktail kits and canned and bottled cocktails to go. And we think that's going to continue. I, we don't think that the laws will ever go back to what they were before, where you cannot sell alcohol to go from a restaurant. So, so Pat, I, I think that you might've heard Jen wrong, um, or I'm sorry, Christine wrong. Um, it was not one drink a day, it was one bottle a day that <laughs> the new dietary guidelines have. <laughs> well, <laughs> I think for a while, the dietary guidelines are gonna go by the wayside. <laughs> but I think once we get out of this pandemic, we were talking about vaccines before, there are some restaurants that are not requiring their employees to get rec vaccine vaccinated. Some chains like Cousin Subs, which is a Wisconsin-based um, sandwich chain, even Chipotle said they are not mandating that their employees get vaccines. So, you know, that's kind of interesting. So it remains to be seen what the acceptance rate will be. So from a marketing standpoint, if it goes public, Chipotle doesn't have, you know, their, their people mandatory uh, vaccinations, but some competitors do, and they publicize the fact that all of our employees uh, have been vaccinated. Um, how does that change the dynamic in your opinion? Well, you know, I guess some consumers are really so wary of patronizing places that aren't, you know, very safe that it probably will turn some off. Um, Chipotle is so, you know, ingrained in our culture now. I don't know if it's really going to affect their business model, but 
who knows? It remains to be seen. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, one of the other things that we see are many more drive throughs because that started during the pandemic and all the fast casuals like Chipotle and uh, others in that category have added drive throughs and all their new store models have drive throughs and some of them don't even have dining areas to eat in. They just have pickup windows and it, we see that as a continuing trend. So maybe that'll make them feel safer if they don't have to sure. go inside. Sure. So Jen, why don't you wrap us up with some good news? Sure, I'm gonna take it back to, to Trader Joe's and another uh, aspect of, of what they've been doing with diversity and inclusion. They've been looking up in terms of their charitable donations at diverse metro areas and through their neighborhood shares program in 2020, they donated $345 million worth of food wow. and beverages um, across the country. Wow, that's unbelievable. Fabulous. Fabulous. So uh, thank you all for joining us today. Remember, our archives are on restaurant business, Winsight Grocery Business, CSP and SupermarketGuru.com. Um, wear a mask. And uh, you, lady in Ralph's in Southern California, meet me there. I'm challenging you. Meet me there. And I'll make sure you're wearing a mask. Until next Tuesday, thank you for joining us.